Welcome back, listeners, to Learning from Friends. This is Cade Curtis, your tour guide for our lovely conversations that I get to have with my friends and sharing some lovely, interesting topics with you. And today is no different. I have one of my really good friends, one of my bowling buddies, as I like to call it, that is really interested in KISS. And is also, I like to call my bowling guru. He really helps me with a lot of my tips and able to advance me to get, become a better bowler. And so we're going to sit back and we're going to talk and share a little bit of his story, a little bit of advice from him to you for that advance, wanting to become a more advanced bowler and also that KISS fan at heart. Tony, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Kate. It's a pleasure to have you, Tony. I didn't remember if I said um, that this is a January episode. So welcome to our listeners in 2022. So you get kind of started in here with that. Tell us, Tony, a little bit about yourself. How do you describe yourself? The audience has no clue who you are. So introduce yourself to them. Well, I guess I'm more of an introvert, quiet, uh, analytical type person, uh, perfectionist. So I want to do the best at anything I put my mind to, which includes bowling. Um, I tend to, you know, uh, travel the road less traveled. I don't like to be involved in like what everybody else thinks is the norm. I like to think that I think for myself. And I always referred to Neil Young once said that he found himself on the uh, main road in life and he quickly turned himself back into the ditch. So (laughs) that's why I kind of relate to that. I'm kind of like that too. (laughs) Yeah, great, great musician with itself and wonderful just kind of quote there yeah 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 i don't know have the exact quote but it's something like that yeah that i always thought that was funny and memorable that uh he he got off the main road because he's more comfortable in the ditch (laughs) there was a quote from one of uh my former guests that said you know keep it between the ditches i guess you're like you know what just go out of the ditches go into it man right right (laughs) exactly it's more interesting (laughs) it it definitely life can be interesting that way whenever you kind of take that that direction i always enjoy talking to you about music Mm -hmm. because it's always an interesting story that you've kind of seen over the years you have an interesting background of you did four years in the air force and then you did 33 years in the post office right right i got 37 years total service so and uh i've been told i don't look as old as i am i'm about turned 61 so uh People think they say, "When did you start? When you're 12?" <laughs> but uh, I guess it's good genes uh, that I look so young. Yeah, it is true. You do have that that young age look too. I whenever I first met you, I'm like early 50s. Yeah, late, yeah. late. You know, yeah. I usually 40s. get about you know seven, eight years younger than what I actually am. Yeah, this is, sometimes it's the way you carry yourself too. Like it's it's a matter you're only as old as you mm. really think you are. So yeah. Tony, how did how did what's your first memory of us kind of meeting? What how do you remember? Uh, that? The first memory I have is uh, we started uh, uh, me and my other friend uh, Rick uh, started the Thursday night doubles league in uh, Woodstock, and it, it, I don't think it was the first week. It might be in the second week, and we bowled against your team, and I just remember thinking something like. Who's this beatnik and this vertically challenged guy? <laughs> <laughs> We're an odd pairing. Yeah, it was an odd friend. couple, definitely. So he's very memorable. It stands out, you know. So uh, that's how we, I guess we first met. That I remember. I don't know what your recollection is, but um, from there, you know, just uh, been in that league ever since, and I enjoy that Thursday night league. There's a lot of good people in it, and uh, yeah, that's a sh- for sure. Statement. I get to, um, you know, I've. I've Gave out bowling tips and advice in the past. Uh, you know, I had uh, John. That's how I became friends with him. Uh, he uh, one night after bowling, he said he was so funny because he says, "Mr. Tony, could you give me some bowling tips?" <laughs> so I, uh, I said, "Sure." So we became fast friends after that, and he he got a lot better, and he had a, his first seven hundred series not long after that. So. I've I've helped quite a few people. I've never been paid to give my advice or give lessons or anything like that. I would just ask that yesterday. I said, no, I've give people, you know, lessons, but I don't ever charge them for it. I just the love of the game, you know. I like to pass along whatever knowledge I have in the game. Yeah, it's definitely that's really my first kind of connection to you is 
of whenever we were bullying me and my friend Garrison, who is like, we, we definitely are polar opposites whenever you look at it. Mm-hmm. You stomped a mud hole in it. So that that oh, was really? Me. I don't remember that. Oh, man, it, was, it wasn't even close and how bad you destroyed us. And my first impression was, okay, this guy has a solid technique. Solid, I, mean, I want to learn from him because I had no idea well, what you, I was doing. Yeah, that's, that's funny because I was, after about two or three leagues, years into the league, um, I was talking to uh, Carlo. One of the guys in the league, you know, in the time when I came in the league, he had the best average in the league. And um, we got to be kind of good friends and talking one night. And he said, yeah, I remember the first night you came in bowling this league. And I said, I watched you bowling. And I said, that's the best bowler in this league. And I said, wow, thanks, Carlo. That means a lot coming from you, you know, because he's a really good bowler himself. So I've, I've got compliments like that in the past, and I don't. I try to stay humble about it, you know, but uh, I guess for a whole 61-year-old, I'm pretty good at it. <laughs> hey, like that. one of the, the fun stories that we get to share is I was bowling against you with my yeah. dad one night whenever you bowled your first 300 Yeah, my first 300 yeah. and you recorded it, so I have that forever. So that was definitely an amazing shared moment, and we also won league together. Yeah, the year that, before, I think. Yeah, the year before, whenever like, your partner had to go back to work, right. and my partner, my dad, bowled with his uh, mm-hmm. brother for a uh, half of it. Mm-hmm. And so we came. it was our first time bowling together as, as a partnership, and we bowled against a former pro bowler and his wife. Right, right, right. And yeah, and I thought we <laughs> lost that because we went into the last I, frame yeah, ahead. I messed up. No, we both got splits in the 10th frame. Yeah. And we're like going from thinking we had it wrapped up to, oh, we just lost. Because he was bowling really well. Yeah, he, he strike, was strike, it. strike, strike every time. And I think all he needed was a he needed nine. One. Yeah, he nine needed pins. nine. That was it. And I didn't even look up. I just had my head down, put my stuff away, and he threw the ball and just kind of a groan from the crowd. And I looked up, and he only had eight. We won by one pin. <laughs> one pin. He striked and strike. He no. He strikes. No. He spared and he needed nine. Yeah. Like he's and the only reason why we're in that predicament is you bowled first and then I was the closing out and I messed up and when I had a split mm-hmm. I had all I I needed to hit was just one pin and mm-hmm. it forced him to no I needed two pins mm-hmm. in order for us to be able to force him to strike mm-hmm. and to three strikes mm-hmm. and my brain goes you know what. I'm I'm going to try to be extra fancy and try to pick up <laughs> yeah, the three pins, it. go for it in order to force him to, yeah, to just automatically yeah. win it and not have to worry about it. Yeah, that was dumb. Yeah, and yeah. I only hit one pin, so it, he yeah, literally but... had to just do that. And then my brain goes, yeah. I, I was thinking the same way of we've lost. We're oh, done. We, I we... screwed up. I started walking off. Right. And then when I turned around and saw everybody's faces, I remember screaming and just jumping and throwing <laughs> my arms down the bowling alley. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was my wasn't my first rodeo. I've won a few times. So. <laughs> that was my first rodeo. That was my first rodeo. So whenever I, me and my friends started, Garrison started bowling. That was your first time bowling in that league as well. Yeah. Huh. Oh, I didn't know Did it was I your first too. Yeah, that was my first time as well. Oh, That's okay. I'd, yeah, I think I think we bowled somebody else that was from like Chicago or somewhere the first week, and then we might have bowled you guys like the second week or something like that. Yeah, we missed the first week, and so that was really our okay. first time actually so, yeah. coming in. But that was our first like okay time. So first I remember, time. Going yeah, I remember through. you come a long way because uh, you weren't very good, <laughs> dude. I was terrible. I think I was averaging like one thirty. Now I'm like right at like 185 ish. Yeah. At yeah. one point, COVID knocked me down from mm-hmm. being a 195 bowler down to about yeah. a 170, 180. Yeah, it gets but, tougher the higher up you go in average. You get to 200, and it's really tough. Yeah, it is because what what are you what are you averaging right now? Uh, I'm at 209 right now. I mean, I've I've uh, I've had an average as high as 219. So I'd like to get to that magical 220. That was kind of a goal. <laughs> hey, always set the goals high and you'll get there. And that's, that's the one thing at the end of the day, you just got to set that goal high mm. and keep riding to it. That, that is, that is for sure. So mm. going backwards a little bit, mm-hmm. when did you, when did you serve your four years in the Air uh, Force? 1979 to 1983. Um, yeah, that was, uh, I was stationed at Lackland in Texas for basic training and then went to, um, um, Biloxi, Mississippi for technical training and then spent the rest of my four years in Valdosta, Georgia. 
Valdosta. <laughs> Moody Air Force Base. Wow. So it uh, didn't go very far. <laughs> yeah, so they weren't moving people around too much during that time period. So I kind of stayed put where I was at for the four years. Wow. So, yeah. And then I got out and because um, they wanted me to re-enlist in a different f- field and I didn't want to do that. So I got out and uh, went to school for a little bit on my G- the GI Bill. And then I um, got a letter from the post office, and it was history after then. I spent the next 33 years at the post office. So, Were you like, what was your role as a in the post office? Did, did you deliver? Did you uh, No, I was what a was... clerk, and I worked a, you know, a number of different jobs as a clerk within the post office. Uh, the first 15 years, or first half, it was pretty much you know, a lot of manual labor. You know, but, you know, you're down on the totem pole of seniority, so that's what you got to do. And I think it was 20 years before I got the weekends off. And then I worked. 20 years, yeah. wow. Then I worked in um, finance for about 12 years. I really liked that. That was challenging, uh, trying to keep payroll adjustments down. And then I worked a little bit, dabbled a little bit in work, filling in for budget, working as a budget analyst. And then the last three or four years I worked as, they call it address management. That's where uh, you keep track of the database and the computers and all that, everybody's address and, uh, you know, if anybody lives in the house, if it's vacant or not, or, you know, just all kinds of different things for different information for the mailers and stuff like that that's all goes into the computer and uh, runs on those machines. So I'd have to go and do basically do audits on carriers and travel around North Georgia and go out on a route and check their route, make sure everything was in order so it could run correctly and in sequence on the machines that they run, you know. So that was neat because I got to um, I got to go out with a different person every day. So it was a different – it wasn't boring because I heard a different story every day, you know. That's true. That does make life interesting. It's kind of like what you're doing. I heard everybody's life history every day. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that kept it interesting. Yeah, I like that. And you were away from all the supervisors and everything because you were kind of on your own. You got in the car in the morning and drove to whatever post office you needed to go to and did your job and came home. So did you have a list that you were kind of working off of? Yeah, to- yeah. I would, you know, they had a history of how many, what routes, when the last time they'd been audited and stuff like that. So I just look and I'd say, okay, this route, this routes haven't been audited in a while. Let's go here, you know, next week. And I'd go there and, uh, and do the, sometimes I would, do the whole office, you know, like, uh, Car- oh, wow. Cartersville, I spent, you know, a long time out there and I did every route in their office because postmaster said, you're welcome. Just set up office here and just do our whole building. <laughs> so that's so did what you, I did. Did you ride with them just once or did you do it multiple times? No, I just wrote, I just came in the morning and I uh, brought a staff car and they would, uh, get, uh, they would drive the staff car and they would just drive the route of their route and, call out the numbers of the addresses and uh, tell me, you know, if it was vacant or if somebody lived there or, you know, and I would just have a sheet printout and shows the order of their route. And so I could keep track of all the different information on there um, uh, to keep everything up to date, you know. And then afterwards, were you coming back and entering in data into a machine? Yeah, I'd have to. If there's any corrections to be made, I have to come back and put it in the computer so they could update it. To update it for the um, the computers that uh, you know handled everything when they run through those big machines. You know, you see going 100 miles an hour. Oh my there. gosh! Yeah, it would read all that information, know where to put it, you know, in order and everything like that. Because if it's not in order, of course, it slows everything down as far as delivery. I still say that the post office is magic. <laughs> now you get one letter from here all the way to California in like seven days. Yeah, people complain about it, but it's really kind of, I've never had an issue with my own mail, you know. It pretty much gets there like it's supposed to. With any system, there's always going to be some yeah, problems. Yeah, there's always nothing's, going to be some problems. Nothing's perfect, no. for sure. But it's we've come a major long way, less than a hundred years ago, no, 120 years ago, we were Pony Expressing it back and forth, and mail would take months to get mm. back and forth. And sending a letter across the ocean, you had to wait, you know, months as well to be able to get a response back and forth. So less than a hundred years, looking at like that's pretty yeah. successful. Yeah, yeah, it's just amazing how much 
uh, technology and everything's evolved and come because when I first started the post office, of course we, we had to sort everything by hand, you know, there was no machines to sort it. Um, so I had to learn like 2000 streets by memory. Oh my gosh. You know, and know what route they went to. Now you think that's hard enough. Then if they had a route change and they jumbled everything up and moved this street to another route, now you got to unremember it and remember where it goes now. Oh Not where gosh. it went there. So, you know, you had to have that capability to do that. And after a while, I became what they call a scheme examiner. And I, um, you know, I gave the test to new employees that came in uh, to learn the what they call the scheme, learn all the streets and stuff by memory. Because I remember uh, they had did an audit on our whole office. And they pulled all the mail out of the cases, you know, checked, make for accuracy. And, and they checked my case. And the guy told his supervisor, whatever, at the time that was running the test, he said, this one's perfect. Oh, wow. He he says, there's no way it's perfect. Check it again. (laughs) (laughs) So he checked it. It was perfect. I had perfect. There was no no mistakes in in my case. It's part of your, just who you are as a person. Yes, like I said, going back to earlier, a perfectionist, you know. Yeah. Because there was a lot of streets that like have one number. Is an exception that ah. goes to another route. You might be on a corner or something like that, you know. So you have to learn all that too. So it's actually more than two thousand because not only two thousand streets I had to learn, I learned a couple more thousand streets that went to other offices in Marietta. Oh, so make sure I didn't that, necessarily have yeah. to know what route they went to, but I had to know what office they went to. Fair, yeah, just to make sure that you weren't but, stepping over top of someone's toes or messing up someone yeah, else's route because or there's, your own. There'll be a street, the same street, in another office, you know. Uh, with different numbers, you know. That's true. You know, like the 100 blocks in this office, uh, 500 blocks in another office, you know. So you got to know that too. So did you kind of enjoy that kind of competition idea of memorizing the scheme? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember when I first started, I was like, I had to work outside in the dead of winter unloading trucks, you know. That's you doing all that grunt work. And and I see those people inside, you know, in the warm. (laughs) <laughs> and I sort and mail. I'm like, and I thought it was just, I was just no way, you know, you can learn all this is at first, you know, at first glance, but I was like, you know what, if they can do it, I can do it. So, you know, I just concentrated on learning that as fast as I could so I could get out of the cold weather. Smart. Hey, incentives. <laughs> yeah. Always having those incentives in place. Yeah. And right now going and we're recording this in December of 2021, like right before Christmas time. Did oh. you, what was working winter Christmas is like for you? Uh, well, it's changed a lot. Um, I mean, it's still heavy. It's time of the year, of course, but, um, now with Amazon, since Amazon started in probably what the mid nineties, I guess. Yeah. Uh, every year has been more and more heavy as far as amount of packages that the post office gets because the post office delivers. Well, now Amazon's getting their own drivers, but when I was still working, they had a contract with Amazon that we, you know, we delivered all that stuff. So, but you can't even at Christmas time right after Thanksgiving through Christmas, you can't even hardly walk in a post office. They have little trails to walk through because yeah, of all yeah. the packages on the floor, just all over the place and carriers are coming in at six o'clock in the morning to deliver packages. And then they come back to the office to pick up the mail that just came in that day. Oh my gosh. I mean, they work, they were out 10 o'clock at night, you know, and that's just, it's crazy. Is there overtime for workers? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's definitely overtime, but you know, I don't know how they do it. I never had to do it, be a carrier, you know, well, we worked enough hours as clerk, but, uh, the carriers, uh, out there so late at night and all those packages and, uh, I, I don't know. That's that's a lot of work, and people just don't appreciate it, you know. They're like, my dad, we like, well, I have I got my mail at seven o'clock. My mail's just now coming. I'm like, <laughs> Dad, you don't realize what kind of workload they got in December. It's crazy. Yeah, I couldn't imagine it. I couldn't handle it. It is insane. So my hats off to all of them that that can do that in uh, December and still be sane. <laughs> <laughs> I've always heard these rumors, and I'm not sure if it's real, and that says of sometimes that there would be someone in the post office that would write back to Santa, uh, write back as Santa for people. Was that ever, did you ever hear or encounter anything like that while at the post office? Um, They've got certain things. I don't know about that. I know, <coughs> excuse me, 
like bet there's a town in Georgia called Bethlehem. Uh-huh. And if you take your mail there, they will postmark at Bethlehem. So that's oh, wow. kind of cool. Yeah. You know? Uh, and then they had like postmarks for North Pole that they would do that too. Yeah. But as far as like right back, like stuff, I don't know. There may have been something years ago about that. I don't know. Yeah. I was just, you always hear those random rumors or something like that of, oh, well, some places still carry that and some places do that. Yeah. Yeah. The weird urban myth or something. Yeah. They, they, they might, I mean, it might be in some smaller places, less populated might do something like that. I don't know. So you were stationed most of the time, but you were always working out of North Georgia. In that sense. Yeah, North Georgia, yeah. So yeah. you you've grown up here in North Georgia or did you live other places? I, I grew up in North Dakota. Uh well, till I was twelve years old, then we moved down here. Wow. So that's why I don't really have an accent, they say. <laughs> <laughs> I used to have a really thick accent and then over time I when I was in college I had to neutralize my accent before going to Ireland to do my student teaching. Mm. So I literally spent three months going to classes Mm -hmm. learning how to neutralize my accent. And some people are like, Oh, there's no way you're from Cherokee County. I go, just get me around someone with a Southern accent and it will jump out fast. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) I'm sure that you talk, you know, talking with my dad that that's where my accent will go to a lot. If I get around the right person and right. Yeah. Some people have problems understanding my dad, but that that (laughs) happens. I didn't know North Dakota. That's cool. Oh yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm from a little small town. Like people say they're from a small town. I said, No, you're not. <laughs> I'm from a small town. I said I think the peak population of the town I grew up in was 120 people. Wow. <laughs> so you you were one of those experiences of, yeah, I went to elementary school and I had, you know, thirteen people in my class and that was about it. And That's that was- about how many people I had in my class. <laughs> you you nailed it. It was about around there. Twelve, fourteen people. Yeah, my, my uh uh uncle used to make the joke of and he graduated. He goes, hey, I graduated high school, and I had 13 people in my class, and I graduated 15th. You're like, yeah. wait, what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is, and you know, I bet you had the one stoplight and the, or the one four way stop in the middle of town. Yeah, we just we had two bars, a general store, and a hardware store. That was it. I mean, there was no gas station. Uh, it was a grocery store there, but. Only part of the time I lived there, not the whole time. So, so you were driving further out in order to yeah, yeah. You, you had to drive like ten miles to get to a grocery store. Yeah, it's that again changes. Lo- people don't understand that location of saying, "Oh yeah, well, right now I live three miles from a grocery store." Mm-hmm. And some people are like, "Oh no, it's so inconvenient to have to go down the store." I go, "When I was growing up, we had to drive thirty minutes either way to go to a gas to not gas station, but to go to." A grocery store because where I lived at in Free Home was thirty minutes either direction yeah. to it, and that was growing up less than thirty years ago, like well thirty up uh, thirty three years ago. Mm-hmm. As far so it's it, I can only imagine back further back as well, and how we're so privileged right now. Mm-hmm. It's like so so privileged to kind of have that people to yeah. understand. Yeah, we play hide and seek on our bikes, and the whole town was the area. <laughs> that's how oh, small it was. <laughs> that's awesome. That is awesome. Yeah. So what? Wait, what kind of bike did you have? Uh, I think it was a. I think it was a Schwinn. Ooh man, you got fancy with a Schwinn. Yeah, I think so. If I remember it. right. Man, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that's hard to remember that far back. <laughs> uh, yeah, it never hurts to ask those random little things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man, so that that that's. That's fun just to kind of hear learning again from mm-hmm. from friends here. I never knew that you grew up in North Dakota. Oh, really? I always thought you were here and, mm, or no. and kind of bouncing back and forth no. around it. And it's fun that we live now less than seven miles from each other now, five miles from each other. It was three miles. At yeah, three miles? Yeah. Yeah, this came up on a GPS tonight when I, I checked. It. I said, I think it's three miles. It came up and said three miles. <laughs> Gotta love it. This, the, just the small world of those things going back. And our lives never would have crossed paths if it wasn't for bowling. No. Like, that's uh-huh. interesting. And with our league, there's 42 of us, something like that. Yeah, it's generally about 20 teams at least. Yeah. It could be up to, I think we had one year, like 26 teams, so. Yeah, so you're talking about you know forty to fifty people. Yeah, because uh, what we bowling is is a doubles league. So you have four people on a lane, you have a partner, and you're going back and forth on these two lanes. And you switch lanes after you've bowled once. Your partner's bowled once, then you switch to the lane next to you, and you kind of repeat the process going back and forth. Then you do it in three games. Mm-hmm. And as you're doing it over these three games, 
you take the scores and you add it kind of up together and you see kind of who has the highest scores between the two, but we play in a handicap league. So what is it? Is it 220 is the number yeah, or 210? 90% of 220. Yeah. So essentially if I had a, a 200 average, I'd get 20 points. Right, no, on, you, not no, 20. you take the difference, so it yeah. be 20 pins and multiply it by 9.9. So you get 18 pins. You get 18, yeah, so 18 pins handicap. So if I'm bowling up against Tony, who has a 220 average, I have a little bit of being able to catch up with him. It gives that, again, handicap. Gives you, So it's not a, if I'm a 100 a pin bowler, I'm not getting squashed yeah. right out of the gate. And so yeah. it makes it fair, fair playing yeah, out. I hate bowling as People have a hundred average. <laughs> <laughs> it makes it hard whenever it they really hard. they get on it and they get a one twenty yeah, one thirty game. All they have game. to do is bowl a few pins above their average and they're killing you. And you you have to consistently bowl that yeah. two twenty two thirty. Yeah, my ceiling is for higher scores is less than theirs is. Yeah, it it really eliminates. That's how me and my friend our first year got really far in the league because we started out being terrible and slowly got better. Oh, that's 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 the way to go. Yeah. People say, I'm no, no good. Well, that's the kind of bowler I want on my team because you're going to get better as the season goes on and you're yep. going to be killing people and they're going to be calling you a sandbagger. <laughs> yes. Sandbagger basically mean the term of you're lowering your average on purpose in order to get bowl whenever you need get to. Get handicap pins to, yep. for your advantage for bonus pins so you can win yep. later. And there's, there's seven points that you can earn per um, set you get two points for each game mm. and then you get one point for the overall pin count so we do it for 23 weeks or 22 weeks 22 weeks yeah 22 23rd weeks. week is if you make uh you win roll one of the halves as a roll yeah. off so you do a let we do 10 weeks we do a first and second place well uh, first and second place play each other for first half winners and then the second half does the same as well we do a uh, 10 more weeks and then first and second play, and then the winners from the two halves sit back and they play each other for the championships. Mm -hmm. That range we've gotten. Me and Tony on our individual teams have each gotten not uh, to our halves. I've blown it several times in the in the <laughs> in the. We blew it the second time we bowled together, mm -hmm. getting into the position rounds uh, to win. But it just it happens. You know, yeah, it's, it happens. So. I've, I've been fortunate enough to win that league three times now. So three? Th yeah. Wow. It's, I only thought it was two. But no, I won with yeah. Rick, I won with you, and I won with uh, another guy named Ronnie. Okay. That was when the pandemic uh, oh. shut everything down. So it was a okay. shortened season, but gotcha. we were on top, so they gave us first place. So Nice. That makes it. I, I just find it so fascinating of how we do have, I think this. they've been doing this league. I can't remember how long our leaders said that they've been doing it for, what, about seven to ten years some, something along those lines. I can't remember the number, huh. but it's interesting seeing those people that have been around that long. That league, we hold about 50 to 70% of the same people each year are coming back and bowling. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of new people come in. I'm surprised every time. Yeah, but it's still nice to mm -hmm. n have a little bit of community because you're mm -hmm. bowling 40, 60, uh, 46 uh, weeks out of the year. You're bowling mm -hmm. with these people. You're seeing them. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and it's interesting that this little bit of relationships you build, because I've made about probably six to 10 people that I consider myself decently close with mm -hmm. that I can go. And some people have left mm -hmm. and I've still made great friendships with them. Another guest we're going to have later that right. uh, it's on is Daniel who bowled in our league for, a, for I think one and a half years and moved away. And I mean, but we still keep in contact in that mm -hmm. sense for it. And I think you actually bowled with him a couple of times on taught him a couple of things. Yeah, yeah. 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 I remember him. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting the relationship you can from bowling. That's it's a wonderful sport. Yeah, yeah, I enjoy you know helping other people get better. So it's uh, I, I'm not gonna push my thoughts on people, but if they come and ask, I'm more than willing to sit down and talk with them. You are, I mean, a plethora of lo of knowledge. <laughs> You're willing you. to share all of it. Well, that's funny because uh, uh, Rick, uh, I guess keep the last names out of it. Yeah, but, uh, I try to do that. As yeah. Well. Um, he came to me, uh, not my teammate Rick, but another Rick, uh, and we were bowling against him one night, and he was like a 190 bowler, and he's just tearing it up that night, you know, I'm like, I said, Rick, what happened? I thought you were a 190 bowler. You, you're not rolling the ball like a 190 bowler, and he says, 
I have you to credit for that. He said, I watched you bowl. And he says, I, oh man, he says, I said, I have to work on my balance. Cause I, I get that all the time. My balance is so, I'm so balanced at the line. Uh, and he started working on it and his average shot up like 15 pins. He's over 200 now. So whenever he's talking about a line, there is a foul line. Whenever you go up to bowl, if you cross that line, there's an alarm going to go off and you're automatically going to lose whatever you hit on that pin. It automatically gives you a zero. So if you're going across that line, if you've bowled a strike before or a spare before, you've automatically lost those extra pins. Or if you all of a sudden bowl a strike when you throw that, it's gone. So it's very important to have that balance coming up to the line and not cross it, but also you want to have that balance. Why do you want to have that balance as well? What was- well, you want to have that balance because I found when I early on when I was working, practicing on my game, and I would videotape myself, and I didn't even have to look at the ball down the lane. But I noticed that every time I stayed, I didn't fall off. You know, people fall off one direction or another. They're, they're off balance. But if you can throw the ball and stay like, Statue of Liberty and hold that pose. <laughs> that's the perfect balance. And I noticed on video when I did that, whenever I was balanced, I almost always threw a good shot. When I was off balance, it was a bad shot. So I worked and I worked and I worked hard on getting better at my balance. And I, apparently it's, it's pretty apparent because I get that all the time. People saying that. You are like a balance. machine. Yeah. The, the one word I have, I hear all the time. I say, I wish. I had a nickel for every time I heard that word is when they describe my bowling and everybody always says, you're so smooth. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And so it, Rick, my teammate, he calls me T smooth. <laughs> well, you have another nickname too. We call it Mr. Seven oh, Mr. Pin. Seven Pin. Yeah. I, my teammate got me for retirement at bowling pin with a number seven on it because I leave so many of them. It's just ridiculous. And then people say, well, you don't miss it much. I said, that's because I have to shoot at it so much. <laughs> the seven pin is when you're looking on the left side of the lane, there's the last pin on the left side right next to the gutter. That's called the seven pin. On the right side is the 10 pin. Depending upon what hand you are when you're bowling, is that's one of the most common pins left behind because yeah, when it hits the pocket. Mm-hmm. And what it's flushing out. And so after a while, if you shoot at it for so long, yeah. you get better at it and you get more familiar with it. And the way you actually taught me to, to be able to shoot better at my 10 pins, because of like watching you shoot your seven pins so many times, like, hey, how do you, what do you do? How do you make your mm-hmm. mark yeah. make this work? Mm-hmm. And so it's an, important to know that. And a mark basically means you're hitting the same consistent spot at each time. And you know, when you hit that, your ball is going to do a certain way and it's going to hold as they call it hold meaning it's going to be, it's going to stay in that same kind of line in order to hook. hit it. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, it's important to, so yeah, me being left-handed, I leave a lot of seven pins, right-handers leave 10 pins. So just clarify that for anybody's confused. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I just, I leave a ton of seven pins and it's, it's, this is what it is. I mean, if you're hitting the pocket, you're going to leave corner pins. It's just, the nature of the game. Yep. And a lot of people, if you, it will kill your score. Your average will never advance if you are not striking or sparing. Sure. It's going to kill it. Yeah. That's what I always tell people. Then practice it. When you practice, you should go and practice on what you're weak at. Don't just go out there and throw in strikes, trying to throw strikes. Yep. Anybody could do that. Work on what you're weak at. If you're weak at your 10 pins, practice 10 pin. You know, or we could another spare. We'll try it. Some centers have it where you can actually set up the particular spare lead to practice that, like Stars and Strikes has that capability. You could go there and pay for an hour and just set up a 10 pin for an hour and just shoot at a 10 pin for an hour. I'm going to call it AMF here and set that up for us on. Yeah, on AMF lanes. doesn't, our, where we bowl doesn't, fortunately, doesn't have that capability. So you kind of have to. Use your imagination on a, on a full rack. Say, yeah, I would have got that. Or <laughs> it's expensive to be able to add that automation yeah, on. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, yeah, you you have to get imagined if you gotta get it smart with it because if, if you don't have that capabilities, you just got to think, okay, where do I need to hit in order to make sure that my line is gonna properly hit or not hit? Mm-hmm. And sometimes I'll just throw a random ball just to see what spares left behind in order to see can I pick this up? Can I make that kind of work? Because mm-hmm. if, if you never know what you're going to get left whenever mm-hmm. you hit the pocket weird. Now we're talking about the pocket is you're wanting to hit. You don't want to hit head on. You want to hit off to the side uh, in between two pins, uh, the, the head pin and one of the side pins in order to get what they call carry, meaning hitting the most pins 
off to the side and carrying it backwards in order to get all your pins down as a strike. Right. right. And depending upon where you hit is what pin it's going to be able to push around. Because what's the distance between each pin? I can't remember how, like, is oh. it an inch to three inch? In between like each pin? Yeah, between each, like, if I put, if between the head pin and the next pin behind it or beside it. Yeah, I just saw right. this information the other day. I was, I already forgot. It seems like it's like a foot between, like, the one pin and the three pin. I, I can't remember now. Yeah, I know, but it, it really, it seems that they're close together. They're not. Yeah, they're 60 really feet, not. it looks like they're close together, but they're not that close. They're not at all. And, again, 60 feet. That's how long it is from. The, the foul line to the mm. back, and that's an important thing to know as your bowler to be able to figure out. What Actually, it's we're sixty at. feet to the the head pin. Oh, to the head pin. Okay, is it sixty three? Yeah, the back about sixty three to the back. So gotcha. So I always figure out the math. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. no, it's important to understand the math whenever you're adding up two. And mm-hmm. if this is something I always you got into me this all the time whenever bowling. I'm trying to count up, okay, how many pins behind? What do I need to do with my score in this? Mm-hmm. Like, Dude, stop. Like, worry yeah, about bowling yeah. the next ball. Right, right. Yeah, right. That's, I learned that too. Is, uh, you uh, just concentrate on the process. Don't worry about the outcome. And I learned, well, that's another thing I was going to talk about. Um, uh, the mental game. Um, there's what was a, that book you there's, there's a good book called With Winning in Mind uh, by Lanny Basham. And he was a uh, Olympic um, target shooter, shooter like yeah. skeet, uh, clay shooter, a gold medalist, but multiple times. Yeah, yeah, but he talks in there about having a proper positive mental attitude and uh, visualization and stuff like that. And it's a really good book, it, just because it pertains to shooting, you could apply it to anything really. Oh yeah, I mean, any sport or any academic side of anything. It's right. all. Right, and so that's a good book for anybody that's looking for the mental part to um, help them with. That's that's a big part of your game, you know. And he talks about that in the book about um, don't worry about the outcome, just worry about the process. You know, if you if you take care of the process, the outcome outcome will will come. And that so, yeah, it's I mean it's it's not a bad read either. So I think it's right out about two hundred pages. Yeah, it's not that long. Big. I didn't I didn't know you. And bought it. Yeah, I bought it and read it after you told me to yeah. get it. I sat back and I read it, and it really did help me boost. Even though a lot of people are like, oh, only ten pins, it helped boost my game ten yeah. pins. Oh, yeah. And from being a one eighty to a one ninety bowler, that takes a lot. Mm-hmm. Like it doesn't seem like much, but it really does. Mm-hmm. And I lost a lot of that whenever COVID hit. To be able to get back in, I'm hoping right. January, I can get back into that rhythm and be able to maybe get back up to my goal is to be at, by the end of next season, July. We're going to see if I get there, uh, listeners, to be a, right at 200 bowler. Mm-hmm. That is my goal by the end of this season that starts in January to be a 200 <laughs> bowler by the end of it. Uh-huh. I'm going to just, just 200, even if it's 199, <laughs> I'm going to take it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's, you got to have those goals. But yeah. I, I, and the, the, the uh, as far as the positive talk, self talk, and all that, it works. Uh, I, and I get lazy about it and I get away from it. And, you know, it shows, you know. So you I talk really, to yourself on the lanes, like really rough. You are rough to yourself. Yeah. I'm on the really lanes. hard on myself. Like I said, a perfectionist in myself, you know. And uh, I, uh, as whereas anybody else sees it totally different, you know. But uh, I'm hard. I don't like to miss anything, you know. Um, they got the app now that works with, at Woodstock called Lane Talk, where it'll keep track of all your spares and your percentage success rate and all that stuff, picking those up. And so that's interesting. That will that will show you really quick where you need help at. <laughs> yeah, I was sitting and doing that manually for a while in order to try to figure out. Mm-hmm. And you got onto me that as well as, Hey, you're getting away from your time of like, you need to focus on the lane rather than writing that down. Right. And it does, it takes away from your concentration because right. you're thinking, okay, well I messed up here multiple times, but when you have it on the app later, you can look at it afterwards. Right. You can, you can then concentrate. Yeah. But well, yeah, all you're thinking should be done in the pit. Once you get up on the lane, turn that off. That's, yep. you know, what you learn takes over. Yeah, it's, it's muscle memory. Mm-hmm. It has to be that muscle memory that you put into place. And there's so many different styles of bowlers out there. There's like the traditional, the transitional, well, yeah, contemporary, yeah. no thumb. I'm a no thumber, mm-hmm. uh, two handed. I mean, each style is different, and mm-hmm. you have to be able to figure that out of who you are. What what style of bowler are you with? When yeah, it comes to I that? would call myself a stroker, um, you know, traditional stroker. Um, I modeled my game after the great Earl Anthony. 
in the left-hander and to me, greatest bowler that's ever lived. Um, but he was very, very simplistic in his approach. There's not a lot of e- extra movement. And I said, that's the way I want to throw. That's the way I want to be. So I modeled my game after him. And it's funny because when I was down in Florida to Kegel, which is a bowling training center, I took a couple lessons. Uh, and the pro down there who had, I don't know if you bowl with Earl or not, but he was kind of in that era. And he was comparing different bowlers to different pros and stuff. And I just curious, I said, Oh, I'm curious. Who would you say that I remind you of? And he didn't even miss a beat. He said, Earl Anthony. <laughs> and I said, well, thank you. Cause that's who I modeled my game after. That's a, that's a big compliment because I, like I said, I consider Earl the best bowlers ever lived. How did you find to be become him like in the model yourself? Cause of, did, did you always start out as a stroker or whenever you first started bowling? That's just you? the way the game was. I mean, there wasn't too many. Mark Roth revolutionized the game, became what they called a cranker. You know, he could just really manipulate his hand position and just really hook, hook it a ton. Uh, but you have to be, you know, have had pretty uh, strong wrist and be able to snap your wrist, at the, uh, you know, as it's coming off your hand and all that stuff, which I had never been quick twitch as they call it. <laughs> so that was never going to work for me. Uh, plus I didn't start till I was almost 30 years old. So, uh, I started late in bowling. So what, what is a, like, can you explain what a stroker bullet era is? Like, can you explain that to our listeners? I, yeah, I, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's just, I'm a, more of a, I don't throw, I don't consider myself throwing a big hook. Uh, the hook I get is mostly generated, um, by the ball. Um, back in the day before these balls were hooked so much, you know, you had to be able to physically make the ball move and hook. And, you know, strokers, they were just basically throw down the second arrow pretty straight, you know, move a few boards into the pocket. So a stroker doesn't really hook it a lot. That's the old school way, you know, but when Mark Roth guys like him came along, they were able to, manipulated the wrist and at, at the point of release and be able to make the ball move a lot more than the stroker can move it. Um, so they were able, they were ha- physically having to do that. Nowadays you just buy a ball out of the box and it can <laughs> do it for you. I mean, bowling balls <laughs> has changed in the last 30 years, like drastically. There's so many cover stocks. You, you've got your mm-hmm. plastic, mm-hmm. your urethane, yeah. your reactive resins, your particle, like, and there's so many hybrids that game has drastically changed. What, can you explain to listeners like what each like what's the point of a cover stock like what does it do and then also like what does the core do to a ball to make it yeah. hook and change it because there's so many choices whenever you walk into a pro oh, yeah. shop yeah I mean the cover stocks are gonna it's like a sponge or like a uh, like a, a tread on a, a tire you know uh, the more tread you got on a tire the more it's gonna grip so the more porous the bowling ball is the cover stock more porous is the quicker it's going to grip the lane and it's going to hook uh sooner whereas a, a ball that's like a what they call a pearl ball which has got uh, it's uh designed to go further down the lane before it hooks but when it does hook it hooks sh- sharper uh kind of like a hockey stick you know shaped like a hockey stick whereas a solid cover ball it hooks earlier it's smoother it hooks more like the shape of a banana so you need, you know, so different balls do different things. The cores are also uh, play a part in that too. Uh, it's kind of like the engine uh, of the bowling ball. And so they play a part in that. Um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> well, we were talking about the engine of it, of, of how like inside the core inside. Yeah. The way it's kind of how it, how it's placed. Yeah. It and yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. How you lay out your grip on your bowling ball. And relative to the core and the ball will make the ball hook sooner, hook later. Uh, also, it can affect it as well as the cover stock. Uh, the cover stock is the main thing that will determine that. Um, but a ball only has so much energy in it, and then it basically dies. So I see a lot of bowlers a lot of times they'll throw in the ball and it start it'll hook, and then right maybe five feet before it hits the head pin. 
you'll see it straighten out. And most people don't see it. I see it all the time. And I just kind of smile. I'm like, you know, I want to say something to him, but I don't say nothing. I'm like, that ball is dead on arrival. That's the wrong ball to use. Put it away. You know, you need something that's going to go further down the lane and store its energy. Uh, because you use up the energy too soon, it's going to do that, and it's just going to hit dead. It's not going to, it's not going to hit hard at all. Yeah, it's not going to give you that carry that you need to go through. Because the idea is, if you're coming at an angle, your idea is, whenever you're a hooker or something like that, you want to have that angle in order to carry more pins. If you're coming out flat, it's not going to get the reaction as they call right, it to hit right. more pins. Right, you have to hit at a certain angle uh, in in the pocket to carry more strikes. Yeah. Straighter is not going to get you. Throwing straight at the head pin is not going to get you anywhere. Straighter is not greater. When it comes <laughs> not to when that. Come, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, but I'll, I always get the question, well, why do you need to have more than one bowling ball? And I always say, use analogy. I'm like, well, you play golf? Like, yeah. Well, you go to the golf course with just your putter? Like, no. <laughs> well, there's your answer. I said, because the bowling pattern, oil patterns on the lanes are different. The time, the time of the year uh, affects bowling lanes. Uh, different lanes are the topography. They might not be completely flat, so that that affects everything. So you have the different bowling balls with different covers on them to hook sooner or hook later to find the right ball to match up to whatever you're bowling on that particular day. Uh, it might be Woodstock one day. You might be bowling Las Vegas another day. And some, you know, cross country where it's just drier. They're right? all different. They're all different. You know, and lanes within bowling are different. Like in Woodstock, lanes one and two. Most people don't like lanes one and oh two. Oh, my gosh. The so cursed those, one and those two. Guys will, like, say, I'll just take the week off. And they're like, oh, everybody that doesn't know anything about bowling. Oh, they're all the same. No, they're not. <laughs> yeah, they're they're not by any means. It's the right next to the doors. So the yeah, conditions right. are a lot. Yeah, so you get the weather dryer. conditions, yeah. Yep. It, whenever we're talking oil, ex- explain wh- why the oil is important on the lanes. What does it do? Uh, well, it, uh, and I think initially was put on the lanes to protect the lanes themselves. Yeah. They were getting beat up pretty hard, but you know, years and years and years ago, but it's also on there for, um, you have to have oil in lanes. Otherwise the ball, if you threw the ball with no oil in lanes, it wouldn't even make it to the arrows and it'd be in the gutter. It would hook across the lane into the gutter. I've seen videos of it. So you have to have oil for it to skid, to get further down the lane, uh, you know, before it starts hooking. Otherwise, if you didn't have any oil lanes, it wouldn't even make it 15 feet and it'd be in the left gutter. <laughs> yeah, and and you always hear this term whenever you're bowling with a group of, of bowlers is the lanes are breaking down. Yeah, yeah. What is What does that mean for the lanes are breaking down if you're bowling with a friend or that is an avid bowler or someone of that sort? What, is, what does that mean? Well, today it means with the reactor resin balls, they're like sponges. They just soak up oil and it soaks into the ball. So it's removing the oil off the first part of the lane. Uh, so when they're saying they're breaking down, it means all that oil has disappeared from the first, you know, 10 feet of the lane. So now as soon as it hits the lane, it starts to hook because there's it's all that friction. There's no, no oil to make it slide. So it, people are having a hard time because they're having to move and to adjust or change balls to try to uh, adjust on the fly because the, the lane conditions are changing. Now, back in the day, you know, when I first started and, you know, going back, way back, when they had plastic and urethane covers, just the opposite happened. The balls didn't soak the oil in, so they went, they took the oil and they carried it down, what they called carry carry down, and they left the oil on the further, closer to the pins. So now the, the ball wouldn't hook, but it wasn't because... It was because the further down the lane, there was no back ends left because there was oil, they were putting oil in the lanes further down the lane. So now it's getting even further before it decided to hook. So it was harder to hook the ball uh, when they started carrying down like that. Yeah, that's uh, I get in a lot of trouble and a lot of people get angry about with me because I, I like to bowl the urethane and I push the oil down. A lot. <laughs> and so if, if you're an inexperienced bowler yeah, yeah. bowling in a league like that and you're trying to learn, it gets really aggravating. Mm-hmm. It, it really does. Yeah, we had a... Uh, it I doesn't had, bother I you, on a team. No, I had people... <laughs> bowling, I got people, women bowling on my side, backup ball, plastic balls all the time. I, I just try to adjust, you know. Um, 
but I, Boulder will always try to learn to adjust. Yeah, I was even like, quit, quit crying, quit crying, and 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 think, and you know, figure a way out, you know, a different way. Um, you know, so yeah, I was bowling with a team uh, last year that they almost came to blows because one of them threw a plastic ball, another <laughs> one said, "If you throw that plastic ball again, I'm gonna kick your butt." <laughs> it, it does. It really does affect how how <laughs> the lanes go, and I get aggravated from time to time whenever someone brings a, a bowling ball from the lanes like they go over and they literally grab one off the wall and then walk over and you're like oh man <laughs> this is gonna throw the night off for yeah. a lot of people yeah I, uh and then i think you asked me one time you noticed that i never wipe my ball down and you asked me why and i'll probably get in trouble for people that know bowling out there but um my opinion is by the time you get back up there to bowl again, that all that wool is soaked into the ball. There's nothing left on the surface of the ball. So what are you wiping it down? There's nothing to wipe down. It's already soaked into the ball. It only takes like a, a minute and a half, I think, for it to, to soak into the ball. So mine's OCD of like doing it now. It's, <laughs> everybody has their little patterns. Yeah, well, you used to do, do that back in the day when you were thin in plastic because it, it settled on the surface of the ball. So it, was, it wouldn't go anywhere. It wasn't going to go into the ball. It would be there next time you went up there. It would just still be on the ball. So people would take a towel and rub it off. Well, the reactive resin balls, they just they soak it in. So the next time when you bowl, you come up there, where's the oil? There's, you don't see it. It's just soaked in the ball already. So I, it's like, what's what's the point? <laughs> True. I, I, it's all perspective, but, uh, I suppose. But a lot of guys will say, oh, yeah, you got to wipe it down. Okay, well, that's just my opinion. Yeah. Everyone's got their own different opinions and superstitions and stuff right. as it goes into it. Because now. I used to be one that wiped it down every time back when it was urethane plastic. Yeah. I, I, I definitely am a... I have my um, sack of chalk. Pick up my sack of chalk. Mm-hmm. I usually bounce it twice in my hand. Mm-hmm. Then I'll walk up, I'll grab the ball, I'll rub it down real quick, and then I'll go slap my fingers in it. And I'm going, and it's almost like a, if you stop me from doing that, like I get out of a rhythm because if you mm-hmm. have yeah. to have your rhythm. Yeah, you got to pre pre-shot ritual yeah, yeah exactly that pre-shot ritual for yeah, it that's just, just when i shot 300 oh my uh, gosh you were in the zone that night so much you got <laughs> to like that fifth frame and you were so in it and i go okay like once we got to the eighth frame and you're in i go i i no longer can talk to tony because i know <laughs> if i do it's gonna throw everything off and uh, you could see that in a bowler yeah. whenever they realize that they're in that rhythm you know that the moment you say something and it throws them off. That rhythm's off. And well, yeah, I, I don't know. It doesn't bother me. And I guess I taken it subconsciously. Took a tip from uh, the um, Lanny Basham's book that night because I wasn't really really thinking about three hundred. I was just thinking about the next shot, making a good shot, you know. And I remember throwing that last ball. And I remember throwing it. I mean, I just went through my pre shot ritual because I've seen too many guys take too much time on the last ball and they get tight and they don't shoot 300. There's it off. Yeah. And I said, if I ever get to that point, I'm just going to go through my pre-shot ritual just like it's a normal shot and shoot it. And what happens, happens. Sure. So that's what I did. I shot it. I threw it. And when it came off my hand, I said, well, I hit my mark. I threw a good shot. Now it's all depends. Is that qu- that seven pin, Mr. Seven pin, <laughs> is that seven pin going to fall or not? And that's all I looked at. I looked at the corner down in seven pin. And I said, and it went, when I saw it go down, I'm like, I didn't have to look for those nine pins. I knew they were gone. You knew it. Yep. <laughs> you knew that you were solid. Yeah. That, that, that for sure. And I remember you sitting down afterwards and it was just that giant sigh of relief because that was a goal of yours. Yeah. For- it was like a monkey off my back yeah. because people couldn't believe that I'd never had 300 in the league before. We had a girl the other night too that. Yeah. Yeah. Bowling. Yeah. That- she never had one either. Yeah. I couldn't believe it either. Yeah. And yeah. Phenomenal bowler. And you're just like, wait, you haven't had a 300. There's no way. Yeah. It, yeah. It's surprising whenever you, you get into that uh, scene that you know, she's probably like me. She probably just left a she probably left a ten pin somewhere along in the game. That's yeah. what would always happen to me. You know, somewhere along the line, I leave a seven pin. So I was like, well, don't you don't need to worry about it because it'll be a seven pop up at some point, <laughs> some way, <laughs> somewhere. But it didn't pop up that night. <laughs> Closest I got was I got eight in a row. Now the ninth frame I blew up, and then I still bowled like the next two frames, strike, strike nine. And I was like. Dang it! Like, <laughs> what happened here? But that's that's the closest I've ever got. Yeah. With that, and I think that was a two seventy six. Yeah. On a beam form, it was like a two. I'm, my app, my math is probably wrong here. On I can't remember exactly what it was. So I know those bowlers are like that doesn't add up. That doesn't yeah, make any sense. Yeah. I can't remember directly on it, guys. It's I'm not if perfect. If you just had all strikes, nine pin, 
There's a 279. Yeah, that okay. Unless it was the first or second frame. No, yeah, it was it was the ninth frame. I bowled the nine. And then I striked, striked. Yeah, yeah. And then nine. It was 279. Yeah, 279 then. Like, yeah, that was that was my highest that I've ever bowled. And one day, one day I will get there. Yeah. It'll take me a while. Yeah. That, that's, it took me a long time before I got mine. I had I've had three in practice, but I never had one in, in And league. you have your seven ser- seven hundred series. Did you get a seven fifty uh, the other day? Uh, no, that night that I shot 300, 793, because I didn't even know I was you, close to 800 that 800 night. 800 series, that's what you're Somebody missing. said something, I don't know if it was you or somebody said, I oh, almost shot 800. I turned around and looked at the scoreboard, 793, and I, oh, I didn't know it was that close. The next accolade, that's 800 not, series. Yeah, the next goal is 800. Yeah. If I get it, I get it. If I don't, I don't. Just to understand with 800 series on it, like the, for a three-game series, the perfect is 900. So 800, you're looking at, you're needing to bowl a... Average of was that two seven or twenty one? You're having to get like a two sixty seven, yeah. like average over each game. It changes mm-hmm. drastically mm-hmm. Uh, for that, and it doesn't matter what kind of it. Can, it does matter kind of what ball it is, but it matters what kind of routine, what kind of regiment you're putting in that time. You put in time. You've, you've worked with coaches. You've made it work in order to get there. So any bowler that thinks that they can walk up and bowl a three hundred. Mm-hmm. You're 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 fooling yourself. Yeah. And if you think that you're going to get there without any help, you're fooling yourself. Yeah. You got to ask around. You got to learn from others, and that's a big a big step. And that was what moved me forward mm-hmm. from being a 130 bowler to being now at like a 180, 190 bowler for sure. Yeah. 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 Definitely want to take advice from the better bowlers. You don't want to take advice from a 150 bowler. <laughs> <laughs> In, any final thoughts on the topic? Because that it's all we could literally talk for hours oh, about I know this it. topic. I know it. Um, I don't. I don't know. Uh, I did when I first started bowling before the internet. There was a book out, another book, talked about the one about mental game. But there was a book out there called Par Bowling. Yeah, you probably still get it. Um, author was Thomas Kouros, K O U R O S, and I always considered that the Bible of bowling. It, he covers everything in that book, and I would just I wore the cover off of it, reading it so much. You know, that's a good thing. Yeah, that's been for pre-internet. You know, <laughs> hey, you got to work through it, and that's if you want the knowledge, you mm-hmm. got to soak it up the best way you can. Yeah, and get it. Yep. So, the first three hundred I had was in practice. That was with a, a urethane ball, a old thunderbolt they called it, and that's I still have that ball because that you know, meant something to it's me. It's special. Yeah. Yeah. Even though it wasn't league, it was the first 300 I ever shot. So I've kept that ball. <laughs> How many bowling balls do you have? Let's be honest oh, here. Oh, sh- uh, probably about 40. <laughs> it's a it's a habit. I've got, I think, uh, 11, 10 or 11 in my basement. Uh, I've had a lot more than that in my lifetime, but I've given a lot to Goodwill. And, you know. You gave me one. Yeah, yeah I sold some of them and gave some away and gave some to Goodwill and, you know. Yeah, so I think I in my garage right now. I probably got about forty. <laughs> so tonight you're wearing a kiss shirt. You're an oh, avid yeah. kiss fan, yeah, of course. Edward. Like <laughs> you, you got to you got to tell me here. Mm-hmm. Like how how long have you been listening to Kiss? Uh, since 1978. What um, what is when did you discover? How did how did you come across uh, it? Came across. I was in a friend's car, uh, neighborhood friend. And we were driving around, and he had the radio on, and a song called Calling Dr. Love came on the radio. And at that point, I wasn't really into music. I played basketball all the time. You know, I was into sports, and so I played basketball nonstop, you know, sun up to sunset. And so I wasn't really into the music thing. And when I heard that on the radio, I'm like, who is that? And I found out who it was, and from that moment on, I've been a Kiss fan. I went out and bought uh first album i bought was uh actually called kiss double platinum which was like a greatest hits collection that's so they've been around for like four or five years up to that point uh well, four years i guess um and still probably my favorite album of, you know or album called them back then cds now, i still call it an album whatever you know still my favorite collection you know uh if i had to pick anything out of my collection which i've got probably about 800 cds in my collection it's still, hey, the, the first one important. is still if i had pick one that's what i want <laughs> yeah. so so you discover it by sitting in your friend's car yeah. and your call me dr love comes on cool. yeah. and you're hooked you start getting yeah. into it how many times have you seen them live 
I don't know exactly, but I would say somewhere between 12 to 15 times. Um, I saw them every tour that came through Atlanta for like 30 years before I finally missed one uh, a few years ago. I think I missed them a couple times now lately. Uh, just older and, you know, they, they changed members and the original members are not with them. Any, the good original guitar player Ace is not with them anymore. The original drummer is not with them anymore. So they're now using replacement members who are wearing Ace and Peter's makeup, which is eh, kind of sacrilegious to me. <laughs> yeah, I kind of agree It's with almost that. like a tribute band, you know, half a tribute band. So it's kind of turned off by, you know, plus set list kind of stays the same. It doesn't change much. So I, I don't really, uh, I haven't seen him a couple of times. I went last time, well, not the last time, but the time before I went to see him. Um, but yeah, I probably about 12 to 15 times I've seen him. And, and yeah. Gene Gene Simmons keeps it going because like, he is a marketing genius. Well, yeah, business wise, he's the you know he's a genius in that respect. Paul is more the musician, the guy that keeps it the boat going in the right direction uh, musically. Uh, I met Paul back in what two thousand eight. That was a highlight of mine. Um, I got to sit there and just one on one talk with him for like ten fifteen minutes. How did that happen? Uh, he was. He had, was dabbled in art, so he was, had some of his paintings in Wentworth Gallery. I think it's in one of the malls off yeah, 285. Yeah, it is. And um, if you bought one of his paintings, you could spend some time with him, take pictures with him, all that kind of stuff. So I said, this is a once-a-lifetime thing. I'm going to do it. So I bought the first painting he ever did, which, you know, it's not the original, but it's uh, a print. Uh, G. Clay, I think they call it whatever. Print, yeah. Uh, now he signed it, original autograph on the painting. So that's original. So I got my picture taken with him with that. And they came right in my house and put it up in my house, you know, uh, oh, wow. and everything. So it was pretty cool. Yeah. But I, I, I just like, Oh, if I meet him, is he going to be a, you know, is he going to be an ass, you know, or how is he going to be and destroy, you know, everything. But he was cool. I mean, I, I yeah, I, I enjoyed it a lot. I know I had met Ace years before that, uh, after he'd gone solo, the guitar player. And uh but I was so awestruck I couldn't even couldn't even say hi. <laughs> you know, I just the celebrity hand, handed him an album and he signed it in front of me, you know, and it's <laughs> here's your opportunity, you don't say anything. So <laughs> Yeah, that, that happens when you get stuck in that in that moment. I remember one of my first concerts, um, standing out line in line waiting to get in. And all of a sudden, one of the band members walks out from the back yeah. and is just standing there for a minute. Like he's waiting for a car to come pick him up. And he's just standing there. No one is paying attention to what kind of what's going on. And I'm just looking around and I notice and I look and I see him standing there. No one's paying attention. No yeah. one's look at it. And I turn to my brother and I go, Hey, there, there's, there's Thurston Moore from Sonic <laughs> Youth. And me and my friend are just standing there awestruck. Yeah, and we don't have the, the nerve to go over and talk. And next thing he's standing there for about a minute. Yeah, and the next thing you know, fan pulls up, he walks in and out, and I'm like, I yeah, had an you opportunity. Missed, you missed there. your opportunity. It yep. is gone. Yep. <laughs> like, yeah, the opportunity. But so when Paul came along, I said, I'm not missing this opportunity. Yeah, smart. Take advantage of those of those things right. entirely. Yeah. So it was cool, and I think I I, I, I um talked to him about his albums and about making another album at the time. They hadn't made an album in like ten years, and uh, he's like, oh, nobody wants to kind of like hit a nerve, you know. It's, ah, nobody wants to, you know, hear anything new. All they wanted to do was hear the old stuff, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and I said, well, I really liked your last album, you know. It was really good, blah, blah. And next thing I know, like a month after that, they were announcing that they're going to make a new album. I was like, oh, maybe <laughs> I had something to do with that. You know, you you, you, uh, you pinched a nerve there. And he goes, yeah. okay, we're yeah. doing this. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, maybe you heard that from me and a few other people and decided to go with it. And, and it's encouraging for musicians to step off and, and take that bounce. Cause a lot of them are afraid to thinking that they're just going to get compared to that, the band that they originally came from. Right. And right. a lot of people get upset. Like, oh, well, you know, it's not the same. It's not meant to be the same. Right. For a musician that when they're in that band, that's the makeup, but they're, they have a life outside of that band. They have other stuff that they like to do. Right. You, don't, you shouldn't expect that from, from an artist mm. at all. Mm. Like, What's what's some of your favorite songs? 
Uh, my two favorite songs are Cold Gin and Love Gun. Ah. That's probably two songs that make me sing it. <laughs> I, I don't sing it. <laughs> but if they come on when a concert, I'll, I'll sing along with those. Yeah, Cold Gin was my first one. Uh, that Actually, that song was written by Ace Frehley, who he wrote a few of their, uh, a few of their songs, but he never sang. He never sang that song. He was too afraid, too shy to sing. Uh, so Gene sang the song. Um, so, uh, yeah, he wrote that song. And then Love Gun was written by Paul uh, early, early on, like a, the Love Gun album. Uh, that's uh, another favorite. But there's so many of them. But that's probably my two favorites. Yeah, I mean, their catalog is so deep now. Uh, yeah, they can play they can play a long time. You know, everybody gets upset. Well, they didn't play this song. They didn't play that song. Well, there's too many songs. They can't put them all in the set. And they've been around for now going on. Was it 60, uh, what the 47 year was it? years now. Yeah. So that's 70, a, February 74 is when the first album came out. So it depends on when you count the history. Do you count it when they're, I counted when their first album dropped. Yeah. Which would be February 74. They were actually together in 73. Uh, so. It's a long career. And when you ever look at musicians and you go, oh, you know, they've been around for 20 years. Like now look at the Rolling Stones, look at Kiss, look at these guys that are still touring yeah. and hit it pretty strong. Like right. That that that's a band right there. That's that's that that, that at twenty years they're just getting broke in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's funny. It's it's been around that long, you know, and I've been with them since uh, you know, after about year four. <laughs> now a lot of people I heard are were really angry about this album, the disco album. How did you feel about that one? What, the Dynasty album? Uh yeah, I remember hearing that on the radio when it came out, sitting in my parents' den and hearing that on the radio. And thought, what the hell is this <laughs> disco song? <laughs> but it grew on me. I mean, it's different than what they've ever done, but they still play that in concert. Now they've changed the arrangement on it, so it's a little bit more, you know, it's rock. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, that was that was departure because Paul said at the time he said he wanted to prove to everybody that anybody could write a could write a disco song. Oh wow! I didn't <laughs> it know it wasn't that. hard. <laughs> And they had a hit with it, top 20 hit with it, you know? That's amazing. Yeah. So he's a great songwriter, in my opinion. Uh, um, he's writing so many good songs. So is he going to be, con- like, who, is he considered, like, your favorite Kiss member, or who's your favorite uh, Kiss When member? I was growing up, it was Ace, the guitar player. Uh, but then as I got older, I, I, I learned and appreciated Paul more. So Ace and Paul are both my favorites. Um, I appreciate probably Paul more now. Because, uh, like I said, he's kept the ship going in the right direction, you know, and through all the lean times when Gene was screwing around acting and movies, and so I thought he was a movie star, and he's just kept the ship going straight ahead, you know, and got through it to, you know, 47 years. Yeah, holy moly, 47 years. Yeah. Do you so, have a favorite lineup? Well, the original lineup, yeah. Ace oh. Peter, and Paul, and Gene. Uh, and and most people, Gene is their favorite person and member, and he's my least favorite. <laughs> I, I feel like he's a walking walking billboard when you really get down into it uh-huh. of how often he he kind of feels like it's almost pushing things on you at times because of how much collectibles, all the different yeah, things yeah, he's yeah, out yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. like he's all into the business part of it and making that. And yeah, hey, don't blame him. People want to complain about it all the time. I'm like. It, you know, hey, hey, it's it's his band. He can do what he wants yeah. to. He's a business he, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you, if if you don't want to get your own band, do what you want to do. This is, and if you don't want to buy it, don't buy it. Yeah, true. You know, if you don't buy it, people enough people don't buy it, then they won't produce it. But as long as the money's there, there's, you, you there's, keep there's riding demand. that train. Yeah, there's demand. People, I don't collect most of it. You know, I just collect the music basically and. You know, I have some posters and stuff. And well, my holy grail of Kiss memorabilia is I have the Kiss pinball machine in my what? house. You have the pinball machine? Yeah. yeah. Like, do you have the original one that yep. came out? Yeah, the original one. Oh, my word. Yeah. Come over sometime and play. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I, I will need to. One of my friends that is a huge Kiss fan is going to hear that and be like, I need to come visit your friend. <laughs> like, who has this? There's yeah. two of them that, that'll, that'll, as soon as I say it, they're, uh, like mother son, they're like, yeah, 
Call me up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a couple things that need some work on it, but uh, it plays. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. That's yeah. so cool. That is so cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. That you, that you have that. So that that is your holy grail. Any other like holy grail? Sorry. Is there any other like consider that you think was interesting merchandise and collectibles that you own of theirs? Hmm. Uh, I don't. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Um, I've got a print. Uh, Lydia Chris took, who was the wife of the drummer, original drummer, of back in like 1973 before they even had an album out. So oh, wow. It's really primitive makeup and stuff. It's a pretty cool poster. I've got that framed and hung up. That's, and it's like a limited edition print. Oh, That's pretty cool. Have you ever done the makeup, dress up, and gone nope, out no nope, never done that <laughs> <laughs> you know you never know everybody's got the little like oh yeah i did that once or twice yeah 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 so no i haven't done that as far as you ask me about songs uh, as far as albums go if i was recommending any albums to anybody out there who would want to check them out i mean most people cite destroyer album as their best album i wouldn't necessarily agree with that but i would say it's in their top you know five of the albums if i had to pick five albums of their of their history that'd be the original album uh destroyer rock and roll over lick it up and creatures those five you got those five that's that's kind of the to me the the best five of of their discography yeah i i enjoy creatures yeah, Creatures like, is... That is a great yeah, album. It's a great album. It's underrated because it came along at a time when they were at their low point. And uh, after an album before that, it was just failed miserably. They tried to do a concept album. And then they came out with this album. And it was just back to just... It was the hardest for rocking album they, they ever made, really. And the drums on that album were phenomenal. Uh, but it didn't sell well because they were, you know, kind of went had been in that downhill mode. But then the album right after that sold well when they took the makeup off, which was um, lick it up. And I always thought that was interesting of going between the two personas after a while because some people like, oh, the band completely changed about the makeup. I'm like, the makeup doesn't make the band right. Like that's just part of the mm. band in the sense of like it's a stage show in that sense. It doesn't change them as a as as a band as a whole. No, no, no. I didn't. I didn't fall in love with them because of the makeup. I fell in love with them because, like I said, listening in the car, hearing a song on the radio, calling Dr. Yeah. Love, which is still one of my favorite songs, but not my all-time favorite. But, yeah. But they That's, do know how to play that. That The makeup, the costuming, it really does add an extra element well, to yeah, the band. They, it separates them. Well, then, and then they, they put on a show, which most people weren't doing then. And now yeah. everybody puts on a show because of it. A lot of people are influenced by that. They put a lot of money into their stage show and they had help when they first started out with uh, choreography and stuff like that. Had a guy that was working with them. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. They worked with them like to do different like in sync movements, you know, like they play guitars and rock back and forth like this, all three of them. Huh. And he, he's, you know, he would teach them to do different things like that, that were very visual that were could see, been, could be seen clearly from long distances. The visual. Yeah. yeah. And have an impact, you know. So, uh, uh, yeah, he worked. Uh, his name was Sean Delaney, and uh, he um, he was kind of like a fifth member, almost, yeah, you know? ahead of his time with yeah, all of them. Yeah, and so he helped him a lot with all that stuff, their stage show and stuff. So, wow, yeah, it was influential. Uh, yeah, that it, I, I always thought that was kind of something that they just kind of came up with, and it's kind of being in sync as a band. But that makes a lot of sense of. That being a scene, because they worked on, they chore- choreographed it. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. intense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> well, we've covered a lot of interesting material here today for sure, and I've learned a lot of amazing different stuff that I had. Getting into the bowling terms for me, that always it always always opens up a little more insight whenever I'm talking to you. It's always something new mm-hmm. uh, every time. And then same talking with Kiss today. Like I have a couple of friends that are really into Kiss. And every so often, I'll kind of talk to him about it, but I don't really get in mm-hmm. depth with it because it's, it doesn't fully click with me. Mm-hmm. In that sense, it does. Either you're like, you are a Kiss fan or you're not. And I'm just kind of like, eh, I'm kind of there. But it's fun to hear the passion in your voice. Mm-hmm. That's the coolest part that with any conversation, I say, it, listeners here, this is my the takeaway from it. If you hear something peak up in their voice, you can hear a tonation, in a, in a intonation change in the voice. 
that is when you tell you've hit a nerve of a positive nerve where they're like, oh yeah, this is something they're passionate about. Listen to it, mm, yeah. encourage it. Right. Because if you're going to make your a better bond for that individual at that point in you're showing that you care. The best gift that you can give someone is your time in listening. Mm -hmm. And whenever you pick up on that, it creates a better friendship. It creates a more longevity to it because it's a two-way street. Mm -hmm. It's not supposed to be a one-sided conversation or one-sided relationship. Mm -hmm. So I recommend that to any listener. Definitely learn from your friends. Learn how to grow on that. Is there any last minute thoughts you want to share or any words of advice that you want to give to our, our listeners here at learning from friends? Um, I don't know, but as I was going to say about passion, you're talking about passion, another video clip you could pull up talking about the passion. Um, when kiss was inducted in the hall of fame, uh, in 2014, and I just got out of the hospital from, uh, open heart surgery and, uh, I pulled up the video that they got elected in the rock and roll hall of fame. Finally, after years of being, they should have been out. there like 10 yeah. years earlier. Eddie hey, Trunk had a big part in that. But the guy that introduced them, I was like, I just like, what? <laughs> it was a, ra- a guitarist from Rage Against Tom the Machine. Morello. Tom Morello. He was a huge Kiss fan. And if you pull up that video on YouTube, it's very, very passionate, his his love for the band. And he, he just encapsulated it perfectly about how it was to be a Kiss fan back in the day. So, yeah, it's worth a look to to, to see that video. Yeah, I mean, for, for sure, it's a exciting to hear someone being passionate about yeah. anything. Yeah. Because it, it shines through. And you can, oh, like, you see that lift in the smile. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I could talk bullying and kiss all day long. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's a, and I look forward to starting back in January on January 6th. My birthday is when the league starts back. Mm-hmm. Now your listeners now know my birthday. Congratulations. I'm giving you more information each time. I hope you're keeping <laughs> up. But uh, I look forward to getting those little conversations because we get to bowl at least two or three times a year against each other. And when mm-hmm. I get to walk into the bowling alley, you get there early. I get there a little yeah. early as well. And I like just to sit yeah, and yeah. talk. Take your time and get, get ready. Don't be rushed and yeah. stuff. And- it makes a big difference in your game. And also it's just making that relationships mm-hmm. it's just enjoying that and that may that's really the only time we really see each other during the week is on bowling but it's, we consistently see each other every week right, right. when that's taking place and that's a a huge deal yeah it really is oh definitely because right. you have your coworkers that you see at work if you're working mm-hmm. and you see that and you may not have a relationship with them and that's just because it's just there mm-hmm. but over yes. time it's you're, you're dedicated you're wanting to be there when you're bowling you yeah. wanted to be there, so you're creating that. Oh yeah, I've 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 remained in a bowling league, which simply because there was people in that league that if I didn't bowl in that league, I wouldn't see them again. True. So I was like, you know, uh, if I'm going to sever ties if I don't keep bowling in this league. <laughs> so find a passion, grow on it, continue to have that in place. It's it's keeps your sanity as well. Having something to do besides just going to work and then going home. Right. Find something that you're passionate about. Right. In you never try bowling. Like, yeah, and, uh, check it out. Practice, practice, practice. Yeah, it does. <laughs> I didn't get that way the way I am by not practicing. It's true. It's, you got to get out there and do the work. <laughs> yeah, put in the work, Tony. Thank you for coming on. I deeply appreciate that. This has been a blast All for right. the past hour and fifteen minutes, twenty minutes here that yeah. we've talked. So, as we're coming to the end here, this has been another amazing episode. We are in the begin- middle of well, end of January here as this episode comes out. Right now we're in December of 2021. I'm trying to get ahead a little bit on recording, and I'm hoping maybe one of these days that my passion will continue to drive me to be releasing weekly rather than bi-weekly. But um, that's a, a, jo- a joy of mine, something that I'm hoping to be able to get to. And how I'm doing that is through the quote that I'm leaving, well, my little catch tag as I leave each one of you today. Remember to let your curiosity fly high. This is how my podcasting is, is live because my curiosities continue to drive. And I encourage that for each and every one of your listeners uh, that are out there. So my name is Cade Curtis, your tour guide from Learning From Friends. I look forward to catching you next week or two weeks after this one. Good night and goodbye. <laughs>